Hello. Hi. Hi, guys. Looks like we are live. Oh, wow. This is kind of cool, isn't it? I like this. This is, this is a nice spin on things. So for everyone who is just joining us, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Jack Moran. I'm joined by Stephen Drew. Uh, we both have worked in architecture recruitment. Um, Stephen also has an interesting history as a part two architect. So Stephen, what I thought I'd do for the benefit of everyone watching, you are my boss normally, but I thought that we'd flip it around today and I ask you some questions so that you can sort of, you know, point out the key information for graduates when it comes to building the perfect CV and portfolio, the do's and don'ts, you know, the things that you've seen over the years that you don't want to see anymore or things that you feel are left out, you know, that they want to, that you want to see further. How does that sound to you? Sounds good to me. I was just double checking where everyone can hear us because I've got a little little unmute button. But so <laughs> sure. All right, we can go for it. So I'm Stephen Drew. I used to be a part two architectural assistant. I trained up in the industry and then I worked uh, at an AJ100 practice called EPR Architects around the time that I was a part one. It was the 2009 recession and I had to find a job during that time when there was absolutely uh there, there, there wasn't many jobs around and so it was a quite a tough time since then i worked in industry for a few more years before doing what i do now which is i focus on getting people jobs and architectural recruitment matching uh architectural practices with people in practice excellent and i think the benefit the graduates will have here is that you know speaking to yourself you've kind of done both sides you know so you've been the architect but now you've gone over to the recruiter side but you've sort of transferred that knowledge of the market and the more technical details so you know you had at one point you still will have your own portfolio um so what i'd like to do is set it out like an interview style i'm going to pretend i'm sort of you know a graduate as well who's coming out of university and i want to ask you things about a potential cv that i would do or portfolio and where you think you know what your expertise would say to do even from the smallest things you know so font size yeah, sure. up, um, up to the level of information i need to put it in. so okay great so let's get dissecting the perfect cv and portfolio so Ooh, perfect cv so wow Drew, let's let's start it off nice and simple okay? okay color what color should i be using on my cv wow that is that is a very difficult one to start with jack i would say whatever color the person feels is appropriate as long as it can be legible you don't want to have for instance a gray background over things if you can't read the text and i kind of believe that the cv should speak for itself and the main focus is the content um who you are what you're about and really you want to make an impact you want the person uh, who is reviewing the cv to quickly get a good impression of what you're about and want and make they want to they want to invite you for an interview so you don't want a color which will detract from that i think really though the emphasis is about oh hello well hello <laughs> oh you, so you joined us fantastic <laughs> good to see you i was just jack asked me what color a cv should be and put me on the spot and i kind of said that basically i think it should be uh, the color's not as important. It's actually the content, really. And the CV is all about making an impression straight away, which resonate, which will resonate with the employer and ideally bring, you know, get you an interview. But what do you think, Well, um, for I, a CV? I'm, I actually not disagree with you, but I've got a slightly different take on it because I think a color can actually not necessarily there's no right color to use but it can actually deter away from the content that's in the cv i think mm -hmm. um if you've got like big bold colors um and it's like all over the place like large blue background dark blue or even red for example i think red's very difficult to read off um, yeah so i think color can it can be a significant factor because you don't want you want to keep it simple i think i think some people go a bit too artistic -y. Sometimes yeah, well, I think I think it's about distractions, isn't it? And the point is, what you're saying is, if a color's a bit off off pace, or for instance, yeah. sometimes people overlay images in the background, and I can get really distracted by it. When really, what you want the person to focus on is who you are, what you can offer, where you what you've done in university, where you've worked in industry, and as well as that, what software you've got, and how to get in contact with you. Really, really basic stuff. So that would be my thoughts excellent okay and so if it comes to a background now 
do you recommend going with sort of plain background, nothing on top of it at all? Like you said, I know with the images, it can be distracting. So would you say the same about backgrounds? It would... I wouldn't have a background. Yeah, yeah that's possible. my opinion. The work should speak for itself. So for me, it's all about a clear text font, which is eligible and is not Comic Sans or anything like that. You may be a really nice, clean, easily presented uh, font, which prints really well. And you want to keep the layout quite simple and efficient. You, I think, and this should be two pages as well. So it should be really light and really, really easy to go through. See, where do you stand? It's an interesting topic, this, because obviously CVs in general, you know, are a fundamental part of getting a job. But being architecture, do you have a bit more freedom to sort of be a bit more creative with the CV as opposed to, you know, someone who might just be going for a job as like a facilities manager or something? Correct. You, yeah. You know, so the cv with a cv you'll have a portfolio and the portfolio should be show an overview of the work you've done and the cv is normally one or two pages and together they paint a picture of who you are and what you're about sometimes you can have a beautiful image or two on a cv but you don't want it too small and you don't want it too big so i've seen examples of an image on a cv where it can almost be a taster to get someone into a to get to the the person reading the CV excited, and then they can have a little look in the portfolio. But equally, a CV can be just text, and that's equally fine as well. What do you think, Will? So I think um, I, I I I I agree with having keeping quite simple. Really, I think some people go overboard with trying to. Uh, convey their architecture flair too much in the CV uh, by adding these backgrounds, maybe like flowers over the CV. So it can be quite distracting. Yeah, uh, no flowers. When you've, got, when, you've, when, you, when you've got your portfolio there, it doesn't need to be too, um, too complicated. I think it's better to be simple and subtle. I think that's the most effective. And when it comes to your sort of color scheme, just keep it neat, really. It's just got to be neat and tidy. Um, that's, that's really what I would say, to yeah. be honest. I agree. The, the content and who you are about should come through, right? The person shouldn't be distracted by anything else. And I think that this theme that we're talking about is mm. core cool, and that transcends text, font, everything. It really, it really should go through for it. It should go through everything. So I believe, so we, let's talk about do's and don'ts for a little bit, Jack, just to jump in. So don'ts is have, you don't want anything that distracts from the from the mission as the CV. And, and the what mission, is the mission? What's the mission? I, I think the mission is to make a positive an impression and gain an interview, right? You want to can you want someone to you want the you need to solve the employer's problem, right? So if I'm running a practice and I have a team, and on that team I'm working on a residential project and I need someone else. They need to look at that CV and the point that comes across from reading that CV is that you can help fix that problem, right? So if you, for instance, showcase that you've on a, that you understand Revit and you've got a 2-1 at, uh, um, at a really good university, and uh, then brilliant, you want to showcase that. And if you've worked in industry as well, you want that to kind of pop. You want that to put that at the top. So in five seconds, you can almost scan down the CV and subliminally, the employer will think, right, this person, there's something there. Let me go to the next level. And then they'll start reading the CV in more detail. And then the idea is that at that point that they're interested, they can see the contact details and get in touch. So for me, that's what a C that's what the CV should do. And a few do's is making that information easily available and pop quickly. So don'ts for me are distractions. So as Will said, we don't want no flowery backgrounds. You don't want a font that's too small or, and, and also a CV that's too long. You're not getting the point across. You're kind of getting lost and you're meandering. And, and therefore you're not, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. So that's my thoughts, but what do you think, Will? Yeah, so I completely agree. I think it's best to always see your CV as a piece of advertisement of yourself. So with like mm. your ads nowadays, obviously they're a bit quirky, so don't 
you know, this is a loose connection to it, but they're quite simple and very short in terms of words, you know, and um, when it comes to CV, you don't want to overload it by paragraphs and paragraphs of writing. You want to keep it short and sweet and concise. I think that's mm. very important because uh, that, that way it gets the message across. It also means that the employer or the hiring manager, whoever's looking at the CV, doesn't switch off because it can be quite uh, lengthy to read paragraphs and paragraphs of writing, which is why I think when it comes to like the layout of the CV, it's got to be simple. Generally, I prefer when I read CVs, I like reading things in chunks. So if it's already chunked for me, it's really helpful. So if you've got like mm. a chunk for one section, for your introduction, a chunk for um, your you know employment history, a chunk for your education history. It's very easy to go through it, see exactly where to look at to find specific information. So if I'm looking for a CV and I see uh, and I want to find out where they worked at before, it's very easy for me to locate that. Um, whereas some people, if you if you write uh, as a big bulk message it can be quite difficult to find that crucial information when we just need to look through and find those key points. So simple, effective and subtle is generally the things I look, I would like to see in the CVs. Yeah, I, I think that that covers a lot of presentation, you know, yes. but what's your thoughts, Jack, on the next, what, what, what kind of bits do you want to talk about next? Maybe. Well, I think, content? you know, it's quite good because obviously the points we just covered, essentially the fundamentals are, you know, don't overload your CV keep it you know keep the vital information there don't overdo it and as will said it's merely an advertisement of yourself you want to almost dangle um you know a carrot stick in front of them uh, and then once you you really want to get the interview that's the mission isn't it to to get in there and then sell yourself further yeah um, so i think it's a really good point um i wanted to ask both of you though uh you know over the years you've worked in the industry what is the most common don't that you see happen in CVs. Now, this can be, you know, from graduates up to, up to the lead. Where where are the most common mistakes in people's CVs and portfolios that you, you find? So for me, I'll say mine first. Well, is that uh, the one I'm always surprised with is people not spell checking. Right? It's a document that uh, it's supposed to be the most important document to the person. You're basically you you're trying to secure an interview and when when you're designing a document sometimes you can almost skim read it right or you you know what you mean so that when you actually read it yourself you don't pick up that there's grammar errors and spelling and actually that's why it's always good to get someone else to read it because the last thing you want to do is have spelling mistakes which detract and kind of put off the employer from inviting you for to an interview so I would double and triple spell check in the CV and make sure it reads well, make sure it's eligible, make sure that the content is thought out and concise. What do you think, Will? Yeah, I completely agree. That's exactly what I was thinking at first when uh, Jack posed the question. Ah, see, I spelling. spelled your point, didn't I? Didn't yeah, I? that's exactly what I was thinking. And, I, you know, we can't reiterate enough how important it is and how many people make the mistake. You know, whether or not English is your first language or not, everyone makes this mistake. And it's like Stephen said, it's just easy to skip over the same word that you've misspelled. I do it all the time. Uh, so it's always important to get a... Um, you know, a different take on it, get someone else to read through it. Um, I think uh, to try and freshen up rather than repeat what Stephen said, um, I think one of the biggest don'ts I see is, is mainly, other than spelling, it would probably be like the amount of pages. I think it's probably less mm. uh, relevant for those starting out, um, you know, students, because you generally don't have enough content to stretch over three pages. Um, uh, that's excluding a portfolio, by the way. I'm just talking about the main CV itself. But as mm. you as you expand your history, education history or work history, a lot of people end up having pages and pages of a CV, and you know yeah. not all of it's relevant. I think you can make it, you can condense it down and make it a maximum of two pages, and then you have that lovely sample portfolio following out after. So I would, um, it's, it's always key to you know be concise, and because I think some people can waffle on a little bit in their CV or talk about things that don't have to talk about the CV, they can save it for the interview instead yeah. um so it's just all about being concise and um yeah that's it <laughs> uh, yeah and the other thing i'd like to jump in with is that you need to make sure again that your contact details are very obvious that you don't want someone to get excited and then 
they can't find they can't they don't know how to get in contact with you and the other thing that i don't think you should rely on in cvs is web links so for example you always need a cv and a portfolio and they should be complementary right you can't expect someone an employer to click a web link and you know the, the cv might be printed out in the office no one's going to type in a long email address you know sorry a long a website so you want the the cv almost like to join on to the portfolio i wouldn't do that and as well looking at some of the some of my thoughts here our little notes before social media accounts you know you don't need to put them on there you want to keep the attention on the cv and portfolio you don't want the employer then to start typing in your know, social media account going on your instagram seeing what you got up to on sunday if it's great and you like you know if you if you've got loads of art there then that's fantastic but the whole mission of the cv is to get to solve the employer's problems and get you in you know the fact that you've worked in industry and you know Revit and you've had good references is what you should be focusing on you don't want people to go off into the meander into the never and uh, you know by that time they don't they've forgotten why they want to meet you so you want to keep the focus there really yeah i think the uh the only social media you should be you should put there you don't have to put it it'd be a linkedin that'd be the only one that's be relevant for it you know you want to mm. keep the instagram stuff away because like steven says it deters you i think it's important when it comes to contact details as well you want to make sure they're you know they're at the top of the page somewhere easily visible and then also I think going into a bit more about contact details, I think people put stuff that you don't necessarily have to include in, and that includes a lot of, I think people put date of births, their home address. Home address is not needed for a CV, and I think actually um, you should always avoid it because the last thing you want uh, is for an employer to see if you're, for example, you're studying at Manchester. One. Yeah. yeah, if you're studying in Manchester and you're, what, you're living in Manchester, but you're applying for a job in London, the last thing you want, you need to, to think you is, need to make yeah you need to yeah. let them know where you're going and, they, and that's a really good point let's talk about that one second because for instance if you're a student who's just come back from america and you don't have an address in britain uh you know i would try to if you are going to put your address on you need to at least say that you're in london or even if it's a friend's address you need something there and um i would always get a british number if we're trying to get a job in london you do that because type in plus three three four four in sometimes can can cause a bit of confusion and then you don't get a call uh so you need to definitely put down a british uk address and phone number there and with with references because we were talking about it yesterday in our little group weren't we well about references where i think that putting down the person to who, who would give the references fine you don't need to put down the your references mobile number down there yet until you go for an interview that should be the final part of the process in my opinion you know and obviously if you are in current employment this is probably a good one to put you should definitely do not put down your current employer as a reference yet or you want to say currently employed at this particular company would respectfully ask you to ask for a reference at the end and maybe for then put down a previous ref ref referral into him yeah i think that a lot of it is um a lot of it sounds you know quite quite like common sense doesn't it but we've all seen it'd be amazing so, yeah so many profile portfolios and cvs where people just don't adhere to this stuff and it's, it's not surprised you know that they don't get that call back yeah, I, I remember once when I had my part one, I remember that my mobile wouldn't work for one day and because it just went, it just broke, right? And the employer rang during that. And so oh, I no. got the call and I rang back and immediately I was on the back foot, you know, from oh, the get go. Yeah. So then I felt really awkward. And it's because basically I didn't fully plan it out or what I should have done is dealt with the problem straight away. But basically they couldn't ring me. And that was the difference because it, it's real life right now and there's all it's it's a tough time and so there's probably 10 people who's also applying for that role so if they can't get a hold of you or you don't make that impact straight away the sad reality is there's probably several cvs as well so you've really got to nail it down it's almost like um it's, 
it's the quick thing of, of for instance, you, you want to, on the CV, you want to get the point across. And then at the end of it, they got to know how to get a hold of you straight away. But the other thing that I think would be good to talk about is your next point, Jack. Um, sorry, I'm reading your list here, but uh, the employment and education. That's, and yeah. Yeah. I going to ask we, you about that. Yeah. So what I, was, what I wanted to ask, because I've seen it myself as well, um, you know, with continuity and, um, you know, seeing your CV and portfolio a bit like a timeline, but the amount of CVs I've seen where there's crossover dates or, you know, there's things that um, simply mm. don't make sense. Uh, so what, what are your sort of advice and tips for people when it comes to putting your employer dates and, you know, your roles on there? Good question. So, I, so, employment dates if you have a gap it's absolutely no problem i always kind of feel that when you have something which you're nervous about so whether it's visa sponsorship or a gap in employment the best thing to do is to tackle it head on right i, I would say exactly why because it's absolutely no shame the the, the 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 bizarre bit comes is if you almost do not explain the the gap so one of my close friends in his cv he went traveling for a year and he said globally went on my motorcycle, travel abroad, in, uh, traveling around, enriching in the experience. He embraced it, the employer liked it, they talked about that, and then that gap was fine. If, for instance, right now, your job has been impacted because of COVID, let's talk about it. Because the reality is several companies right now have had to make tough decisions and fellow people or make redundancies. There is absolutely no shame in embracing it. And I think that addressing gaps in the CV is the right thing. The other thing, yeah, the moment that I've seen some, some examples though, when you dig deeper into a CV and actually the dates don't really tally up with the LinkedIn and it's a bit confusing. And then I actually, then in my head, I start visualizing if this person is altering the fabrics of what is real, then what else will be there? You know, yeah. and, and then so there's this feeling then of a lack of trust. So any gaps in the employment, explain them. And, you know, if you've had to, for instance, if you've if you've had a child and you've been working at home and you want to get back into industry, say that, embrace that, because that's real life. Real life happens. You know, we we we, we know this. We've been we're on furlough. It makes complete sense. We, obviously, we want to come back when when it when it's when it's when everything is right. But right now, that's the reality of the situation. I'm not embarrassed to say it, because the thing is that real life these things happen so going back to your point always embrace real life explain these things and if you hit it head on at the start and say why it becomes a non-issue so then when you go into the interview you're not worried you don't feel like you're hiding something or you're embarrassed what do you think yeah. will yeah i completely agree i've seen so many cvs that um uh, maybe you've got you've been to like you know multiple jobs and then this, but the dates for these jobs are 2020 uh, 2019 to 2020 and the other one's 2017 2019 yeah that's it's just, a like, bit really vague. vague it's very vague and you immediately my natural reaction is to think okay what are they hiding whereas if you had said maybe I went traveling during this uh, during these periods I only spent uh, like a year and a month at this place and um, unfortunately this place had to close down because they had, um, you know, had to make people redundant, mm. run out of money because of whatever going on. So it's important just to head, tackle it head on because then you have nothing to hide and it's, you know, you know, um, it, everyone's human. So I, I, that's what I, that's what I would say. Uh, but I think you've really hit the nail on the head there, Steve, with those points really. Um, I could, thing, um, oh yeah, sorry, we'll go I was gonna say the only thing I'd add as well is maybe the particular order that you set it up. So okay. in terms of chronological order i think some people for some reason like to do it from oldest to newest at the bottom and it always should be the other way around just like your portfolio where it should be the most recent at the top and then each one goes down but with the dates include the months and the year uh, you don't have to include what day it's just the month and the year is um sufficient enough That's i agree and the, the only thing I'd add to that is that you probably want to put a bit more emphasis on the, the 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 last few roles. So, for instance, let's pretend you're a design director and your whole career, you've gone through several different stages. You can just say that you were a part one back in the day. You don't need to necessarily talk about everything you did as a part one because you progressed since then. So you, maybe you'll talk about the last two or three roles in more detail. So, for instance, on on on, on 
on my LinkedIn, for instance, my emphasis is on my current roles and what I'm up to. And I mentioned that I was a part one before. I don't necessarily talk about all the the things I did in great length. You know, what you want to kind of cover off in an architectural CV, in my opinion, once you've worked in industry, you want to talk about where you've currently worked, what your role was on the project. You want to talk about the the size of the project and the the for the the, the the sector so for instance if i'm currently when i was at when i was at epr i was working on a residential scheme which was large scale based in london using microstation right that's the that's the main key point what i don't need to do is talk about i don't need to tell you the ins and outs of everything you want to hit dead on you want to talk about the sector the REBA stages, thank you, Chris, I completely agree, whether it's stage one or stage five, because really that's the important bit. The employer will then know if you've worked on front end stages or you've worked on technical stages. And ideally, if you've done all REBA stages, then you're painting the picture to the employer that you've carried a building through. For instance, if you've worked on stages one to three, then it's really important you put that in because actually, if a project's at stage four, you're probably not the right fit. And you're going to be overwhelmed so it's you need to kind of state exactly what you've done in industry if you're and if you haven't worked in industry yet and so as a student you want to talk about what software you've done and you want to you want you want to give it in you want you don't almost don't in the cv need to talk about the the academic thesis behind it. It's more about, I went to this university, I got this grade and it's the scores. And actually then, if you haven't worked in an architectural practice yet, talk a little bit about what you've done in in in, 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 in terms of work. So on my CV, it was that I worked in Waitrose, but I didn't talk about everything I did at Waitrose. I didn't talk about me getting the chickens out of the oven. But what I did say is that I worked and I, and I liaise with people and actually I was involved with sales, I was involved with logistics and I kept it really, really brief. But that showed that I actually was someone that was a professionally engaged. You know, I had done stuff as well as the, during the time I studied. But what, that's my thoughts on it, really. Okay, yeah, I think that. Okay, go on. Yeah, I was just going to say what you said about the waitressing is quite good, Stephen. I think for a, for a, particularly a lot of the graduates, they're going to be coming out of uni looking for their first job. Now, mm. it's going to be an intimidating process for a lot of people. Uh, I think what the the risk some graduates will do are say they've had like yourself jobs outside of architecture before, but they will put a huge amount of detail and responsibility yeah, you, in, into such a role, and it, it makes it sound mm. like you know that they they were almost at like a managerial position. And I think, you know, that's not what employers want because they can generally get a good idea of what you've done in that role. But what, what do you think? I think you keep it, I think it's more about what you want to do from putting that on the CV is to show that you're someone that's hardworking, right? And you've been employed. So that's the bit you want to take away. So I think on, on my way to us, it would be work full time, here and there, did this, this, that while studying and talk about it and say, I did this, while I was working, while I was while I was studying, so that I could get through my degree in architecture. Because I tell you what, then if you came to me, I'd be talking about that, and then I'd be talking about your interest in architecture. And the fact is, you supported yourself going through it. So I think it's very commendable to put that stuff in. But obviously, the bit that you always want to focus on, the main thing in the CV, is if you have worked in industry, that is the focus right and then any other transferable work skills then you talk about it so you want so if you're a student i see it as education first and any internships anything you've done like that or anything architectural related then goes at the front if you and if you haven't and if and then you talk about other work experience if you are an architect for instance and you have several years experience of course, we're going to put the education there. We need to instantly know when you've got your ARB so people can visualize how long you've been practicing. But you want to talk about your most recent work first and the examples. You want to be literal. You want to be like, who, what, where, when, why? So you want to be like, I was a project architect on a 20 million pound residential scheme, stages one, two, three, and uh, I did this other project as well. So you go boom, 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 boom. And then you talk a little bit about what you did as part two and you trail off from part one. 
Excellent. OK. And that feeds quite nicely into the next topic I wanted to bring up. Um, this bit more specific is talking about the software, you know, uh, particular proficiency. Um, now, we know, uh, you know, working in the market that we do, we understand how some software, you know, has been on the incline and, and some has been on the decline. Yeah. When it comes to, you know, using software, which is a fundamental part of architecture, what is your advice for, you know, talking about one's skill at a particular software, Revit, for example? It's a good question because I've got the, the truth is I've got two thoughts in my mind. So my tutor always used to say to me, right? So Revit, for instance, is a piece of software. It's a design tool, right? But it, it doesn't you can you can have Revit, but the reality is you need an architect to, to drive Revit. You need you know, an architect needs to design and needs to know how to design a building. It, the, the Revit can't do that for you. And the other part of it is from working in recruitment, though, again, it goes back to the to the point of an employer has a problem or an employer will have a current setup, okay? So the fact that is, the truth is, if you know Revit right now, you do have an advantage because you will be joining an architecture practice. And if they use Revit, which is the way it's all going because of BIM, then you, if you have that skill set, you are putting yourself at a massive advantage compared to someone who doesn't, you know. That's not to say, it's not a measurement of your design skills. So software is an interesting one where actually, I think software can be the big difference in you getting a job or not. So for instance, me and Will work with some architecture practices. And if you do not have Revit, the reality is we can't get you an interview. And there's been times, isn't it, Will, where we got really close or for instance, there was one architecture practice and they interviewed a friend of mine actually, and they really liked him. And it was just the fact he didn't know Revit was the, the difference between him getting the job or not. So I do think showcasing all the software you know is really important. And so I can just see a question that's come in. It's really subjective and uh, how you how you put that on a piece of paper. Because as remember, Will, remember one of my, um, one of the candidates I was speaking to was like, yes, I'm a Revit whiz, I'm the best, yes. that's 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. And then uh, she did a Revit test and didn't get such a high score. Whereas, for instance, I know a few people, there was a BIM coordinator who basically says that he can use it and he's used it for a length of time. And he was the one that was a BIM maestro. So I think to say, on CVs, you're seven out of 10. On Revit, for instance, is that is highly subjective. So the way I go about with software is to be literal. So I would say, if, if you're a student, I would say, I have used Revit for one or two years on a project, uh, on my academic project. If you've used it then in industry, I would say that during my employment at EPR, I use Revit for two years because what you're doing is you're being, you're quantifying it in a length of time and which isn't subjective because it's a fact then that you worked on that project, right? For that period of time and you were using Revit. And that is something that is actually quant, you can, you can, is tangible because it, that's a period of time you used it. And I think that's the way I would go. I personally, you see some CVs and there'll be a bar out of 10. And to, you know, I think I did when I was a student because I put my CV on the on, on the architecture social. You can have a little look at it there. And at the time, I think I said excellent intermediate. And I look back and that's subjective. What I should have done is said the length of time that I used the programs. But what do you think, Will? Yeah, I've, I've seen so many people you know rate themselves out of 10. And yes, it is quite subjective. But it's also, it's quite visually, like, if I want to quickly see through something and I can see someone feels they're confident with Revit, great. You know, if they've got Revit, if they've mentioned Revit on their software skills list, been fantastic because i that's really helpful well, what do does seven out of ten mean no will yeah. yeah i know i know, Come on, I know i'm I gonna, gonna play devil's advocate with you here it's a debate right so yeah i know <laughs> so so go on no go on tell me okay, seven so, out of 10. So how long have you used yeah, well, Revit for then seven out of ten yeah but it gives me an indicator that they know what they're talking about when it comes to revit but right. obviously, you know, I, I don't use that as face value. You know, it's, it's an indicator to the employer, but the employer is not going to hire you based on the fact that you've done seven out, you got seven out of 10 on Revit on your CV. I would, I would, I would, hire, I, would I would hire you on the fact that you've done uh, architectural recruitment for close to two years, right? That's tangible. But 
if you send me a CV and you said you're eight out of 10 in recruitment, what does that mean? Why are you eight out of 10? Because you're good at speaking with people? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I <laughs> it's too <laughs> subjective, isn't it? It's yeah. just too, and it's too, it just, I don't, I think with anything on a CV, you know, architecture or not, using stars to rate yourself at a particular skill is, is you know, is, is very subjective and you're not going to take much from it. Uh, especially, I think what Stephen said, you know, if you can just talk about your experience, a professional Revit experience, using it on a project, the type of project, the scale, the stages, that there's just a short information about that is going to do a lot more for any potential employers than, you know, a few star levels. Of what you do you know do. I'm thinking out loud as well? If you, for instance, got certified in the Revit course, that is a fact. So... I, I think that and that has we've seen that though well, well haven't we yeah. well, for instance if someone's got an autocad professional revit license then the re, uh, sorry certified revit professional i think that's what it is then the reality is you you must be good in some shape or form and i think for me i guess what my point is the more and more you can be literal the more and more you can be factual then that is something that solves the problem right so for instance so for me in the cv it should be all about who you are what you've done and can you do it so for instance if when i send my cv epr invited me for an interview because i said i know microstation i've been to westminster and i've got a 2-1 i'm in london here's my my contact details would you get me for an interview and it was that combination that got me in and during the interview they talked about microstation and picked it up you know and it was the cv getting those points across and then when i got to the interview then you go the portfolio is the bit you talk about for the next step so the cv will or it's it's the gateways to get you in the interview and some and 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 then when you're in the interview sometimes it can be the sole focus or it can it can be the not talked about at all so for instance on a client side role in architecture and a developer they will just go through the cv it's not a case of looking at the portfolio but when you're a student the cv and the portfolio is what really um gets you gets you going and just on that as well because we just had a question come in from sahir which i think will be a nice question for you two to answer actually and it refers to you know what's the most commonly used software um, that we've experienced. And I imagine the answer is going to be relatively the same. But Stephen, you know, you first, what, what do you think? What's shown most for you over the years? Revit is where it's at now, BIM. And, and that's, that's purely because of the way projects are built anymore. So at the time I used to use MicroStation. Now it's all going towards BIM. So pra large practices predominantly use Revit now. And it's, you've still got some practices which use AutoCAD and MicroStation. The reality is though, for instance, the requirements I get in terms of recruitment, the briefs that me and Will work on, usually Revit is almost a prerequisite now. So to the short answer for me is it's Revit is the one that's gonna get you a, a more likely chance of getting a job. What do you think, Will? Yeah, abs absolutely Revit. I think, um, I mean, like you said, all, all the roles we get are predominantly Revit based, even practices that don't use Revit inherently, they're setting, they're setting things up to move over to Revit because they don't want to be left behind uh, yeah. in terms of the industry and with the government as well with um, trying, uh, you know, making certain buildings, BIM level two, um, it has to be BIM, BIM level two, then a lot of practices need to use Revit in order to be able to get up to BIM level two to then also win more projects in the future. So they don't want to be left behind. So it's actually a need for the industry uh, for practices to move over to Revit. So that that is the that is the main software to go to at the moment. Uh, it's the one that you should focus the most on. Not to say that there aren't practices out there that aren't using MicroStation or Vectorworks. There are still out there, but the majority, particularly large practices, the bigger the building, the more likely they're using Revit for those um, for these types of jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And we've just had a follow up question from Nada on that. Um, Will, I want to point this one to you first, actually. So say I'm you know, a graduate and I haven't got that much experience on, say, using a particular software, Revit, for example. Do you think it's me wasting my time by applying for a role or do you think that there are any practices that might you know offer some training what are your thoughts on that 
Um, it's absolutely not a waste of time. Uh, it's always it's better to apply and get rejected than not apply and never know at all. Uh, you're not you're not wasting your time. You know you're only wasting your time if you spend really long on the application. All you need to do is just send that application across. Mm. Let them decide. Um, I mean, I've placed people who didn't have Revit and got and ends up getting Revit training at their new practice, despite the initial requirements being that they need to have Revit because their design skills shone through. So it's actually always worth applying and then seeing where it goes. Of course, some practices will be uptight and be like, no, we need someone with Revit because we have this immediate requirement. We need um, this to happen now. Um, and they don't have time for training. But I think particularly as well with students, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, but I imagine yeah. when it comes to part ones or part twos, the requirement for Revit is probably a little bit less important compared to further up the chain because they're willing to invest in the students in the first place to train them up. And so naturally yeah. that comes with the software, I'd imagine. Is that right? I think I think it's a pre it's a pre it's it's not a prerequisite. The thing is though, if you've used um it's it's more about your ability to learn almost. So for instance, if I was a student, you don't need to be the BIM expert, but what you need to do is you need to go to the interview and be like, I've started on my own initiative to do a little bit. And you can see here that I've, I've done two or three weeks of it and already I'm learning. And I think it's the eagerness to learn. So it's not so much as black and white. If you don't have it, you don't get through the door. But what you should do is you want to show lateral skills. You want to show the employer that you've used certain software and that you can learn this one. You want to show an eagerness and appetite to learn. And, um, that's where you really want to go with it. So I would always say that you, you you can always say that you have some exposure to Revit and you you want to build it up from there, you know. And I think that the way around it is that it's almost sometimes you shouldn't wait for a job with just to learn the catch twenty two hours. I speak to people and they go, Oh no, I'm not gonna you know do Revit until someone I work on a Revit project and really if you just show a little bit of keenness and, and a little bit of ability to learn and challenge yourself an employer will normally take more of a chance on you than if if for instance you do not do revit and you say there's one thing to say i want to i want i will use revit in my next job and i will learn then what you've actually got to do is do a little bit on your own accord and show that you're eager and hungry to learn i think that's a big thing isn't it like going that extra mile to sort of stand out and then there must be a lot of online resources for people who wish to better themselves at you know such software uh, but like yeah. we all said i think the big thing is you know graduate level is, is it's not going to be such a fundamental thing that you have to have x amount of experience uh, because you know but like you said the lateral skills are what makes a difference aren't they if you're showing that eagerness and that passion and you're you know you're showing that you're serious about the role then surely they're going to give you that platform to sort of you know train you up on a particular software um so let's go going back to the sort of CV and portfolio. So we now got a good CV. It's looking nice and tidy. Now, this is an interesting question um, that I want to put to both of you. And it comes to the about me and, you know, the hobby section that you you often see on people's CVs. And I can only say for myself, because I've worked on both architecture roles and a lot of support roles, the office manager, HR roles, practice managers. And the about me section is always quite an interesting read. But I f what are your thoughts on it? Because for me, it's what actually shows you probably the most, you know, sort of character about, about that person. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. And it, but the thing is, is that it, what it does is it paints a picture of who you are as a person. And it's, I think it's very different to say that you're involved in a charity or you, you, you know, that you're a part of an athlete's team than posting your Instagram. You know, it's commendable. It shows that anything, for instance, that you do uh, and as that you enjoy as a human, giving back anything like that is really key. So, for instance, karate club, you could put that in. And it's a talking point. And I think um, for me, it's really important. So, for instance, if I, because I, you know, I grew up in Wales, for instance, if someone was really happy and really passionate about rugby, and I was too, then that is a conversation piece. And then you can almost show who you are as a person, and you get a little bit of an insight. And that's very different, though, to a social platform, a social profile. I think it's nice. So anything involved in charity, anything given back, I think is really, really key. What we don't need to know about, though, is the fact that in the hobbies that you might put down food or video games yeah well i, I love video games but 
you know, we need a bit more than that. Give me, give me, tell me a little bit about what your passion is in terms of maybe you like collecting vintage cars or who knows, right? Or that you, you do wine tasting on the weekend. If you're involved with a charity, that's great. But we need something a little bit, something which is a conversation point, which is a mundane. So we don't need to know that you like Lord of the Rings. What we do need to know is that we, what that you are involved and you give back to charity or you've mentored anyone or you if you if you've done anything volunteering, then that's interesting. You know, if you're part of a student society, brilliant, put that in. If you, for instance, enjoy going down the pub with your mates, let's probably leave that bit out. You know, we can that doesn't that doesn't need to be on there. You know, we yeah, just keep keep it keep it light professional and showcase the stuff that you've done which shows what you are like as a person yeah well excellent yeah i think it, something that um you want you want to sort of keep it professional a hobby something that you wouldn't be surprised that they'd ask you in the interview to find out a bit more for example they're not going to talk about oh tell me a bit more about the nights down on a saturday night with your friends tell me a bit more about that they're going to be talking about you have a hobby is like your vintage collection but like, oh what what kind of stuff have you been collecting or if you've got like shared interests like karate club you're like yeah, yeah i joined the karate club as well it actually it, it helps because you kind of bond in the interview because of it and that increases that instantly increases your chances of uh, coming out of that interview with um, you know positive vibes so keep it professional keep it short keep it sweet though because you don't want to take it's the option it's the place to put your personality on your cv but at the same time you don't want to take away from your um your well relevant work experience or your relevant education history as well so you don't want to make it like the main focus it just needs to be short and sweet um either at the top of the cv where you, you're about you section or you may be at the bottom just to say you know i enjoy I like it at the bottom i think yeah. it's like the tail end you know it's basically in the cv you almost want to go the running order of your name, who you are, what your mission is, what education you've got in employment straight away. And then you want to talk about software so that they know what software you've done or skills. And then you want to talk about, in my opinion, stuff, references, accomplishments, stuff like that. And then interest. Interest would be like the tail end. So imagine it as if it's like a little sweet note at the end, you know? that you the, the fact that you do volunteering is that little nice ah oh, and then they go right let's invite will into an interview thanks okay so we've got a couple of questions coming as well then i want to um, put this forward one of these questions we did kind of discuss yesterday is the idea of you know cover letters um is, is it a good idea to attach one i think taken from yesterday's sort of thing we all agree with it doesn't hurt to have a cover letter because it, again it is going you know a bit above and beyond is showing that extra effort but what steven do you think it's a fundamental difference seeing the cover letters or not i i'm contra i can't i go back and forth is the truth i don't know how i feel about them sometimes i do think if you have a polished cv and a beautiful cover and letter which is elegant and a portfolio you're almost painting this picture of the you, it's like this well-rounded almost nice work of art and as an architect or a designer if you can design a beautiful cv and portfolio and a cover and letter then to me that that shows your design flair and your kudos and you want to care about it so i think if you view it like that it's really important do i think it's the difference between you getting the job or not probably not i uh, so i think it's nice to do but the emphasis the cv the cv is the core or it's, it's, it's the string so the, the cv is the backbone for everything the CV gets the portfolio and the covering letter is not as valuable as the CV. So if it's not there, it's not the end of the world. Does that make sense? What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I'm with it. yeah I'm exactly the same. I always go back and forth. And so I'm going to stick with the opinion of maybe it's always worth making you cover a letter, I think, because um, some, some, you know, some, employers you know they don't really care for a covering letter but others do so it's always worth having one handy so you don't have to quickly write one up if you suddenly see a job advertisement that requests a covering letter it's best mm. to have one on standby so you can then just throw it in because the last thing you want to do is about to apply for a job then realize that they want you to do a covering letter so you have to do, write up a covering letter get that then uh, read through as well so there's no spelling mistakes or anything like that and it can take a little bit of time and obviously you know 
that time allows other people to apply for that job in between, putting you on the back foot. So I think it's always worth making a covering letter. But um, if you don't have a covering letter, I don't think it's the end of the world. But I think some employers just like having having quick, them. Quick things about covering letters. My sort of initial thoughts, that you don't want them too long and they're not a replacement for the CV. So do not expect an employer to read something in the covering letter, which isn't on the CV and pick it up. The CV is the core organ. You know, it's like the heart, the lungs, everything. And the covering letter is a supportive document. So it should be really quick and get the point across. It should think of it like what you wanna do is bring the employer really quickly along the journey. So you, they need to quickly get to the CV, engage in the CV, and then look at the portfolio. The covering letter really is that it's a covering letter of the CV and no covering letter in the world will save you from problems in the CV. So, and also I think that, so the format in my head is you have a, an email, which isn't too long. So it's a few lines personalized to an employer. Then you attach a covering letter, then you attach a CV, then you attach a, the, the portfolio. They all need to be under 10 megabytes in case they're, they're um, there, uh, the, 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 there's a there's a file uh, limit on, for instance, the email of the employer. You want to make sure that you get the point across. The other thing I'm just jumping in on my head. The other thing we want is file size. You don't want the CV to be too big because you don't want to be clunky. And then when you export the CV, I mean, you don't want it, for instance, to be modeled in Photoshop and come out all pixely. You need it to be eligible as well. So it needs to be. A CV file is, should be no bigger than what two meg will. Do you yeah, think like two megabyte? But keep it down. And I mean, that's my thoughts on it. So definitely, I think that's um, and like we were discussing um, yesterday as well about how a lot of practices have their own IT systems in place, and you know, a lot of potential employers, if if they for some reason have a conflict or something where they can't view the CV or if it's too big, their cloud system won't open it. You know, nine times out of ten, they're probably just going to put that one aside. Look yeah. at the other applications that they have that work that fine then they might come back to it if there is a need to um, Do you know so what on that where i jack if it in head don't put your cv on a, on a on a website and expect the employer to click it and don't put it on like a dropbox link or anything because no. people will not and then it's more likely to be spam isn't it yeah. so you want to put it in you want the you want the raw cv you want pdfs all the way you want to you want pdfs for every file Sorry, I just got so I get so anxious about thinking about <laughs> someone we have doing problem, all this amazing work and then it doesn't get downloaded because it's on. Oh, uh, what's that one that we can't even open that we transfer? I can't oh, open yeah. it. If, if someone sends us a CV from we transfer, I got to send it to IT. I got to raise a ticket on the system. <laughs> oh, and I'm not good at this. So by the time of it, I'm fed, I'm fed up. Right. <laughs> I and then and then uh, then I'm I'm annoyed before I even open the CV up, which isn't good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, that's, a, that's such a big thing to think about. But I think a lot of people wouldn't, you know, it's not really something if you're like a graduate applying for a role, you probably wouldn't be thinking. You about wouldn't their think. ID. And, 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 the, and you know what, if you've not thought about this stuff before, do not worry about it. This is the stuff that I picked up and learned over over the years. And this is based upon my experience now of convey. You, it's about what works and what doesn't. So mm -hmm. I just saw another question post. An issue link is the same thing. It Any, is, yeah. It's not the um, so Elena. My opinion is you do not send anything an issue at all. You you definitely send a CV in a PDF and a portfolio in a PDF because you're creating more work for the employer, aren't you? Yeah, you, 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 it, and it's and there's distractions because issue. How does issue survive? There's loads of adverts on there. You get distracted, yeah. and then it's not re it's not real. So send a PDF because if the employer wants to print it out, then they can print it out. You have yeah. to kind of go to back to almost basic stuff. Try not to reinvent the wheel. If you've got your own per, uh, website with stuff there, that's great. But the website really is a supporting document. And another don't is don't ex think that your website with all the content is a clever way of a CV. You are, it's just one of these things that in the architecture industry, you should have a CV and a portfolio. And you know what? I kind of agree. It's something nice about doing a beautiful document, a beautiful CV and portfolio. And like back it before the COVID days, it's something you should be proud to take to an interview, almost like a document. You don't, you know, that you, it's a, something that you're proud with. And the thing is with digital, with a website, it's almost not tangible. And so you want to cover the digital world, but really 
this this document this cv needs to stand the test of being printed out and looking good and being presented it needs to it needs to almost feel beautiful and tangible and real and the pdf at least then the person can download it and then you take the nice version you know if you've got your file if you've got your file on like a dropbox somewhere or you've got your website and you've got no cv and portfolio i just don't think it has the same kind of feel yeah definitely. absolutely anything to add to that will yeah just uh just avoid links that's literally all i would say <laughs> yeah. there you go yeah, we'll avoid, avoid links <laughs> just avoid links yeah. uh, it because... comes from our experience though, doesn't it like even with the e2 links we thought we all get sent e2 links and our mimecast which is our our sort of um internal like cloud it system that will always mm. block it as well and then it creates more work for us so it's always you know if we put ourselves as the employer we'll you know you'll be the same as well it's just going to really put them off isn't it just giving yeah. them more work yeah, so for, for, for me, it's the CV needs to support all your beautiful work and it needs to communicate who you are. That's the brief. If you boil it down, the CV should illustrate your fantastic design skills and who you are and that you should get, it, ideally, get someone excited to meet you. That's the brief. That's the intention to get you in, a, in an interview where you can convey to the, you can have a chat with the employer. And I think that the cv that's the core mission and anything that subtracts from it is not good always think when you're doing it what why are you doing this what are you showing you want to you want to showcase your grades you've got you want to show your design ability and flair and if you have done for instance volunteering work and you've given back then great you want to show that and if you've learned revit on your own accord while studying then brilliant, you're ambitious. So we really want, you want to get the point across. It needs to be oozing with who you are. And if, for instance, it's really hard to understand who you are or in it, or things go on too long and they're not clear and dates don't match, I'm losing confidence and I'm losing excitement. And so I think it's about making that quick impression. It, to me, and I use the analogy all the time, sadly, we're almost in this culture of swipe to the left, swipe to the right, like Tinder. And I think that you want the CV to kind of to, to quickly make that impression and then have the, the, the information there which someone can delve in to get you an interview. You do not want to be uh, swiped to the, is it right, Jack? Is that what the, yeah, you don't want to be blocked <laughs> by, uh, by, <laughs> by not having good contact information, a way to get a hold of you. And they just go, they give up. Right. That's a great analogy, though, Stephen, if you think about it, because yeah. the same amount of time you would spend looking at someone's Tinder profile is near enough the same amount of time that an employer might look for your CV. And it's either going to go into the yes pile to the no pile. So it's your job to make sure that that you're short. You stand out. Well, yeah. Tinder's a modern app. But if you think about it, the human psychology, when I go on a website, I've got five seconds and I scan and think, right, where am I going? Do I like this website? And what, can I find what I want? And if I can't and it's confusing or I get frustrated when clicking a link or it doesn't work, what happens? You go to another website and it's the same concept of you need you want the employer to invite you to the interview that's the goal you have to make it easy for them and 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 you, the way to do that is to kind of follow the stuff we talked about before clear and concise and and hopefully then you, you will secure that interview what you don't want to do is being swiped for the right because you've got what was our list so far don't have an image in the background have wrong dates do not uh, talk about having a curry in the evening you know do not show your instagram thing and you know if you've got ten thousand followers that's great do not put it on there you know you want it you want it to you want it to focus on who you are as a person what you've done architecturally who what you get excited about what software you've learned your ability to learn software and the fact that you're you want to work with that and you're excited and the fact that if they hired you then they've got someone who is a real goal getter and adds value to the team. I think that's um, a good point, is there? Because uh, Majid came in with a couple of questions. The second one 
talking about, you know, should the CV, that should be the simple, clear format and then portfolio is that way to demonstrate his skills. Um, like Stephen said before, you know, the CV is very much a professional document. Uh, you want it to detail, you know, to have the content as to what you've done within the role, what software you utilize, what stages you worked on, um, keep it professional and keep it um, concise as well. And then when it goes to the portfolio, that's where you're going to be able to show a bit more of your technical drawings, your design skills, and that can be a bit more visual. Having said that, we've all seen portfolios in the past that have just been far too much. It's, it's almost like reading a, a Lord of the Rings book or something. It's a hundred pages in length and it's just never going to catch the eye of any employers. Obviously, graduates are naturally going to have a much shorter portfolio. Yeah. But, you know, keep it, keep remember, it's all about sort of dangling that carrot in front of employer. Get the initial interest so that if you do secure the interview, once you go in there, you're going to be able to sell yourself in a different light. Um, I agree. I think this, 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 let's take a step back. And so CVs, let's summarize. Keep it simple. Do's. It needs to, it needs to, it needs to support who you are. Get right details down. Get your any architectural stuff that you've done professional experience at the front. Make it clear what it's about. And you want to, you want to, for instance, go through all your education, get it on there and your grades, put the software that you're learning. And as well, do put down relevant hobbies and any achievements you've done and make sure that you've got your contact details and referrals there. But with all of this stuff, this is just my opinion from my perspective. Different employers, we're all human beings. We have different, we have different thoughts about what works and what doesn't. So the, what I would take from this is this is just my opinion. Uh, based upon what I've seen, if you have any questions or thoughts of, of if you're if you're wondering anything in particular so on the architecture social write a comment we I, we will all try to do if we will try to get back to you and, and let you know what we think but for me uh, i don't really have anything more to go into what do you think will yeah absolutely clear concise get your grammar right and um make it look pretty but i think subtle is um always better than cv that's my okay. think cool all right well i'll try to smile a bit more next time this is the first one so i was a little bit nervous sorry guys it seems so serious i got a little <laughs> bit nervous getting on here it's like oh no <laughs> but hopefully that was um like really helpful for the graduates you know it's the cv and portfolio is a big thing so you know unless there's anything to add from you guys that's great i think i think we've covered everything if you have any questions uh let us know and we'll answer them and thank yeah. you so everyone much everyone more. thank you thank you jack us. for hosting and <laughs> thank, you. thank you will for working out to do this and uh yeah thanks for putting up with me guys you're the best team love you both that's why i hired you very good tvs <laughs> all right thanks, then thank guys. you everyone have a good weekend bye take care everyone bye bye